My name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. Well, we are bringing our study of the resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15 to a close. Now, be assured, I understand I have not answered every question. <laughs> I told you at the very outset of this study, I would not be able. Uh, e even now, the three. this is, I think, 315 videos. I wouldn't be able to answer all of the questions. And so I hope that these videos give you enough evidence, give you enough material, enough meat, if you please, to continue your own studies. 1 Corinthians 15 is without a doubt a challenging chapter for anyone. And anyone who suggests that it's as easy as it can be is simply fooling themselves, and they're attempting to fool you. I mean, it's just that simple. Some of the greatest minds in the entire history of Christianity have and still do struggle with this great chapter. But what I've shared with you here, you know, it, it can be summarized under several different headings, obviously. I've shared with you that no matter what our concept of the resurrection might be, it would be in fulfillment of God's Old Covenant promises made to Old Covenant Israel. That does not mean by any stretch of the imagination that the resurrection is strictly and solely to or for Israel since death predated Israel. Death passed on all men since all men sinned. And that was prior to Israel. Romans chapter 5. And so, while the promises are now couched in the promises made to Israel, we cannot lose sight of the fact that the problem predated Israel all the way back to creation. That problem came from Adam, Noah, Abraham, Israel. But we cannot lose sight of that. Why is that important? It is important because since the promise of the resurrection was made to Old Covenant Israel, Old Covenant Israel after the flesh, Romans chapters 9, 1 to 3, that means that if the resurrection has not been fulfilled, then God's Old Covenant promises made to Old Covenant Israel remain valid. That means the law of Moses remains valid. After all, Jesus said, not one jot, not one tittle shall pass from the law until it is all, not some of it, not a little bit of it, not even most of it, not some aspects of it, until all is fulfilled. So when we approach this great chapter, even though we must realize that it's a, it is the ultimate expression of mankind's hope for deliverance from the bondage of fear, fear of death. And thus goes all the way back to creation. We find it encapsulated in, epitomized by God's promises to Old Covenant Israel. I've shared with you, second of all, that contra the popular view that Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 was arguing with those who denied the resurrection, period. The resurrection of the physical body. No, that is not what was being denied. This is proven by the fact that Paul is using a series of logical arguments known as the if-then type of argumentation. If you take this position, then this must be true. That's Paul's form of argumentation. So Paul is saying... If the dead are not raised, then those who fell asleep, i.e. those who died in Christ, in other words, if the dead ones are not raised, then Christians are not raised. Now, the point of Paul's argument is this. The scoffers at Corinth do not believe that Christians have perished. Or else Paul's argument would be absolutely futile. When Paul said, if the dead ones are not raised, your faith is in vain. 
Folks, the, the scoffers don't believe their faith is in vain. The, the dead ones are a select, special, distinctive group separate from Christians. Well, if the scoffers were denying resurrection for anyone and everyone, then when Paul said, look, folks, if the dead ones are not raised, uh, even those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished, the scoffers would have said, absolutely, that's our point, Paul. But no, by pointing out that if these dead ones do not rise, if they don't get resurrection life, then Christians have perished, dead Christians have perished, Paul is making an extremely powerful point. They do not deny resurrection life to Christians, but Paul is arguing if you deny resurrection life to this group, then you have to deny it to that group. This is proof positive, absolutely proof positive. Paul is not addressing death comprehensively considered, or the dead comprehensively considered. It is only a select group. Paul's talking about those who had died before Christ, that those scoffers in Corinth were denying resurrection life too. This group would not rise. This group would not live. And Paul challenges that in a host of ways, as we have seen. We've done linguistic studies on, on the words for mortal and corruption in 1 Corinthians 15. The, the words that are used here, phthora is one of them, and aphthora, corruption. These are words that are used throughout the New Testament in the majority of cases to speak of moral corruption not biological corruption. And thus, when Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 is talking about corruption versus incorruption, we have some very strong evidence to demonstrate to us that Paul is talking about the resurrection out of sin and corruption rather than a deliverance from biological corruption. We have studied this issue of the resurrection based upon Romans chapter 6 through 8. And we have shown that Paul's discussion of death, mortality, the body, and the work of the Spirit in Romans 6 through 8 precludes any possibility that he is talking about biological death, biological resurrection. After all, Paul said, if the Spirit of Christ dwells in you, the body is dead. That means if and only if the Holy Spirit was in them, was the body dead? Is our biological death dependent upon Christ being in us? No. When Paul says in Romans chapter 8, you are not in the flesh. And when he says, you are in the Spirit, he wasn't talking about people in disembodied, you know, spiritual bodies. He wasn't talking about biological flesh versus non-biological flesh. No. And it's in that context that Paul talks about the mortal body being transformed to the immortal, that body of flesh, that body of corruption, that body of sin, being transformed into the glorious body of Christ. And of course, we have discussed the resurrection through the prism of the new creation. We have shown that without any variation whatsoever, when the, when the Bible talks about the coming of the new creation, the old, cre the old creation to be destroyed was the old creation of old covenant Israel. Israel, that according to 
according to scholarship today, okay, this is not a preterist invention, and you have to catch the power of this. Matter of fact, I was reading, yeah, I was reading N.T. Wright just recently, going back and rereading the book. N.T. Wright says, Israel, well, first of all, he says, Abraham had become or was representative of Adam. And then he goes ahead to say, Israel was the corporate representation of Adam. Now, what he's saying there is the story of redemption is one unbroken, united story. The story of Adam is the story of Abraham. The story of Abraham is the story of Israel. And so when people scoff at this idea of Israel encapsulating, Israel epitomizing the the narrative of Israel, sin and death, really, they're flying in the face of some of the world's greatest scholarship. It's not, it's not a preterist invention at all. But the point being that the old creation of Adam, the old creation of Abraham, the old creation of Israel was to pass away, giving way to the new creation of Jesus Christ. And it is in that new creation that you and I are made new creation, 2 Corinthians 5.17. It is in Jesus Christ in which we have all spiritual blessings. It is in Jesus Christ in which there is no sickness. There is no sin. There is no death. That's in Christ. Outside of Christ, all of those things still exist. Doesn't it make you want to be in Christ? Where all the fullness of the Godhead dwells, dwells bodily in him. Doesn't it make you want to be a member of that body, that world, that new creation? It's a marvelous new creation. Finally, I've shared with you that just as Paul says, that the resurrection is the time in which sin, the sting of death, would be overcome. As I've said numerous times, you deal with sin, you've dealt with death. You know what's tragic? What is so horrifically tragic is that the great evangelical world claims, oh, we have forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Well, wait a minute. If the wages of sin is biological death, do you see the train coming? And do you catch the power of this? If the wages of sin is physical death, then if you and I are forgiven of of our sin, washed, cleansed, redeemed, made pure by the blood of Jesus Christ, we do not die. Let me see. Jesus said, If a man believes in me, he shall never die. What what an incredible tragedy when the evangelical world says, oh, yeah, yeah, we're forgiven. Oh, but we've still got to uh, pay the wages of sin. Why? The wages of sin is death. But wait a minute. I'm forgiven of sin. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, continually cleanses us from all unrighteousness. If I'm continually cleansed of any and all unrighteousness, why do I have to pay any penalty for sin? Where is my sin? If it's continually washed away by Christ. And thus, and thus, you deal with sin. 
you've dealt with death. And thus Paul could say, because Paul knew that the coming of Christ to take away sin, Romans 11, 25 to 27, was right at, the, right at the door. He knew that not all, even of the Corinthians, would die until that event. He knew they had been given the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit to guarantee that coming day, that coming day of redemption, that coming day of forgiveness. And thus, he could say, thanks be to God who gives us the victory. Folks, if we don't have forgiveness now in Christ through faith in Him, by being buried with Him by baptism into Christ where that forgiveness, where that life is, guess what? If we don't have that forgiveness, there is no victory. If we are in Christ, that's where the victory is. That's where life is. Because He is the resurrection and the life. So we'll see you on the flip side.